Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel and to highlights of stage six of Paranese 2021 from Brignol to Biot, a medium mountain stage with over 3,000 meters climbing. The finish was actually quite difficult. Two kilometers averaging about 5.3%. It was a 500 meter section in the first kilometer of the climb that was over 6%. So it's pretty obvious this was gonna be one for the punchers like Roglic or the climbing sprinters like Michael Matthews or I thought Magnus Court. It was a pretty straightforward stage. Cavagna tried to get in a break with Trenton earlier, but then the main break of the day had Campanats, El Fares, Elisonde, Perez, Iver, and Alexei Lutschenko, the Kazakh national champion for Astana Premier Tech. They never got really more than three minutes leash from the peloton, who were led by Jumbo Visma, but they were also given some assistance by Team Bike Exchange, who were riding for either Matthews or Lucas Hamilton. Unfortunately, Brandon McNulty suffered a crash and had to abandon the stage, which is a real shame. I couldn't wait to see how he'd go on stage seven today. I hope he's okay. But the death knell for the breakaway was Alexei Lutschenko getting a mechanical with just over 20 kilometers to go. I thought the strongest rider in that break. Lutschenko changed his bike with a push from Vinokurov, but initially he tried to chase back. Then I think he realized it was a lost cause and allowed himself to be subsumed back into the peloton, resting up perhaps for tomorrow. Elisande went clear. He earned the combative jersey for his performance in yesterday's stage. But surprisingly, at least to me, it was de Koenig Quickstep who had taken it upon themselves to chase down Elisande. Merku on the front here, Sam Bennett in the green jersey behind them seemed to be the rider they were riding for. It was Jonas Ruch, the EF education rider, the young German big engine who attacked at a really good place. All these rollers in the last 15 kilometers to the finish. He eventually caught up with Kenny Elisande who'd been in the break for like two and a half, three hours. And they had these extended downhill sections where you still needed to pedal and Jonas Ruch couldn't understand why Kenny Alisson wouldn't pull through. I think there's a 35 centimeter height difference and probably a 30 kilo plus weight difference and Kenny Alisson was just hanging on for dear life on these downhill drags. There was no way he was going to be able to pull through. He probably would have caused the duo to lose time to the peloton. A second mechanical befell one of Astana Premier Tech's lead riders. Vlasov having a mechanical in the last five kilometers he managed to change his bike pretty quickly, use the convoy and the last part of the descent into the final climb to get back on. He didn't lose any time today, so pretty slick work from Vlasov staying cool there. With Quickstep closing rapidly, Elisande offered Ruch one last pull before Ruch went on his own in the last three kilometers. He had about a five to six second lead on this last descent into the two kilometer climb. But it quickly took its toll on the big German with Quickstep leading with Seneschal. They caught him about halfway through the climb as they were going under the Flamme Rouge. Seneschal leading out Primoz Roglic. Christophe Laporte is the tall cofferdist rider on Primoz Roglic wheel. Sam Bennett, fourth wheel in the green jersey. And you can see here as they go into the Flamme Rouge that Sam Bennett was already getting dropped. And Seneschal obviously didn't realize because he kept pacing for the next 500 meters. Maybe the radio didn't work or they thought Bennett was just getting into Bling's wheel here and trying to get into a better position. The thing I didn't understand was with Seneschal pacing like this, putting his own teammate under pressure was none of the other teams would have set a really hard pace at this point. Lucas Hamilton wouldn't have paced for Michael Matthews. Tish Benut had no teammates. Still in terms of Byron Victorious was isolated. Mark Schachmann was really out of position at the back of this group and spent the whole climb trying to move up. Roglic is obviously completely isolated and he's not going to set pace with 750 meters to go on this climb so it only would have been Cofidis with multiple riders but they would have taken a bit of time to move up because Guillaume Martin is quite deep in the group which we'll see later but anyway fortunately for Primoz Roglic at least he got a magic lead out from Seneschal keeping it all together for him on the climb while Schachmann was trying to move up 600 meters to go and this was playing out perfectly for Primoz Roglic who would like a steady firm pace on this climb and then be able to punch up the last little kicker at the end. Schachmann eventually moves over trying to get onto Primoz Roglic and Michael Matthews wheel. Meanwhile Sam Bennett cracks completely doing the Kwiatkowski track stand on the climb. When it pans back to Seneschal you can see that he's gassed right now. Guillaume Martin is trying to move up on the right hand side of the Cofidis rider but still no other teams came forward. They seemed happy to wait for the final sprint and that meant Roglic didn't really get put under pressure on this climb. No one attacked him despite his isolation early in the climb like Shaklin or Tish Benut. By this point with about 500 meters to go Seneschal is completely blowing up. He's checking A why are you all still on my wheel and B, where Sam Bennett. Everyone was trying to get into position through this chicane. Guillaume Martin was trying to move up on the right hand side. He's got Christophe Laporte third wheel in a pretty good position and with on paper a lot more punch than Primoz Roglic but he has to wait his turn. I think it might be Pater Pantra in front of him, the Azure Citroen rider. Eventually 
the gap opens up for Guillaume Martin, who starts doing a reverse lead out for Christophe Laporte. I think a really good move from Kofidis. Roglic having to close him down. But unfortunately for Kofidis, Primoz, it ain't much, but it's honest work. We're living in his world, not yours. Roglic was able to close that down really easy on that flatter, quicker section before the last 200, 150 meters where it kicks up once again. So Roglic got the Martin draft, was bringing Christophe Laporte and Michael Matthews with him, who should have more punch than him in this finish and who've both been in the draft for the entirety of the climb as well. But Roglic goes on the barrier side, and he dusts off Christophe Laporte, Michael Matthews, turns Cockard and Pater Pantra by a significant margin in this finish, asserting his dominance on this Paris-Nice race. His second stage win after an excellent time trial in stage three. Roglic consistency, not just race by race, but stage by stage. He's always competitive in any finish except for a pure bunch sprint. And you've got to love the wholesome moment with his family after the race. Here's the results. Roglic first, Laporte second, Matthews third, Turns, Petter Pantra, Lucas Hamilton, Kokar, Pacher, Sergio and out, Nealands. Roglic extending his lead on GC over Schachman to 41 seconds. Yonis Aguirre third and his teammate Alexander Vlasov fourth, one second behind him. Some of you may be thinking, was the Guillaume Martin reverse lead out for Laporte the best move or should he have gone in front of Roglic and just set pace, kept it together so that Christophe Laporte didn't have to surge to follow Roglic's wheel? I don't really think so. I think it was a good move from Guillaume Martin. Roglic was isolated and who's to say that if Roglic was fresher with the normal lead out from Guillaume Martin, he wouldn't have won by an even bigger margin. As I said, we saw this in the Vuelta stage 10 last year on a similar finish when Roglic was in the sprinter's jersey. That stage had a thousand meters less climbing and the finish was 500 meters shorter with a similar gradient than today. Sam Bennett was the favorite in that Vuelta stage and you look at the finish today significantly harder 500 meters longer with a steeper section from 1500 to 1k to go and yet quick step road for Sam Bennett today makes zero sense to me he never had a chance for the stage. I thought they'd attack with Remy Cavagnar late but they actually tried to get him in a break earlier. Maybe they were just wanting to see how Bennett's climbing was going before Milano San Remo. Today's stage has an altered route but still the same finish, 120k stage culminating in the Val de Blore La Colmien climb, 16.2k's at 6.2%, very regular climb. Obviously if a breakaway doesn't win, Roglic is the heavy, heavy favourite to win this stage. I think the big, big chance from a breakaway is Lutschenko out of mechanical unfortunately today. He's far enough back on GC. We saw he was strong in back-to-back -back breakaway stages in the UAE Tour, particularly on a regular finish up to Jebel Jai. But unfortunately for him, there was a strong headwind and he got caught in the crossfire with the GC group attacking behind. And remember, we remember Jonas Vingegaard bridging across to him. He won out of a break on Montaguo last year when Ineos and Jumbo Visma didn't pace too hard. So he's a massive chance for today's stage, Lutschenko. Hope you enjoyed the video. Check out the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast if you want to see recaps of every single World Tour and Women's World Tour race. Obviously, Tirreno Adriatico is happening at the same time. But I'll see you with highlights of the mountaintop finish tomorrow. Ciao.